In this tutorial, we're going to look at the scientific field of drugs. So the first aim is, can you describe the four general types of drugs and how they affect the body? Then can you explain the health impacts of smoking tobacco and drinking alcohol? And then finally, can you explain the ethical issues around organ donation? So a drug is basically a chemical that interferes with chemical reactions that occur in the body, specifically those which occur in the nervous system. Drugs can be beneficial and harmful, but there are three main uses. Firstly, medical, then recreational for leisure, and thirdly, performance enhancing drugs. These are drugs taken by athletes to improve their performance at a particular sport. I'm sure you're well aware that some drugs can be extremely addictive. Addictive drugs send signals or electrical impulses down a specific network of neurons in your brain called the reward pathway. When impulses are sent down the reward pathway, they make you feel good and encourage the repetition of that behaviour. Well-known addictive drugs include heroin, caffeine, nicotine and cocaine. There are two issues with addictive drugs. Firstly, the more you take, the more you can tolerate. In other words, you'll need larger amounts to experience the benefit of that drug. Secondly, addictive drugs can lead to withdrawal symptoms. These are painful side effects experienced when we're deprived of that specific drug. In fact, because the drug physically changes your body to depend on it, some withdrawal symptoms can in fact be life-threatening. This is why breaking an addiction can be harder than simply stopping taking that drug. So many drugs operate by affecting the synapse between two neurons. If this makes no sense to you, please watch the tutorial on hormonal and nervous communication in B1. The first group of drugs are called the painkillers. Some are very commonly used drugs such as paracetamol, which can be received over the counter without any prescription. They alleviate things such as headaches. Morphine, however, is a very, very strong painkiller. The word morphine actually comes from the Roman god of dreams, Morpheus. I imagine for a similar reason, the film The Matrix also has a character called Morpheus. Now, morphine is not an over-the-counter drug. You will need a prescription from a doctor to take morphine, as it's a very, very heavy painkiller. So this is how painkillers work. If you remember from the previous tutorial on hormonal and nervous communication, um, nerve endings contain chemicals called neurotransmitters. And for an electrical impulse to travel from one neuron to another, those neurotransmitter substances must bond to these receptor sites on the next neuron. What painkillers do is quite simply they have a complementary shape to these receptor sites so they can actually block these receptor sites. As a result, these neurotransmitters cannot bond to the receptor sites and so no impulse can pass. As no impulse can pass, it means you feel no sensation. In other words, pain has been blocked. Next up are stimulants. These are drugs that speed up your reflexes or decrease your reaction time. Those two things mean the same thing. So in other words, you'll react faster, your heart rate will increase and so on. Common stimulants include caffeine and nicotine from cigarettes. So this is how a stimulant may work. It will bond to the receptor on the presynaptic membrane. This will cause the release of far more neurotransmitter substances than normal. This means that there is repeated or more frequent stimulation of these receptor sites. So more impulses will travel from one neuron to the next. The result is you will start to respond faster to a stimulus. Next up are the depressants. These are drugs which do the opposite to what stimulants do. They slow everything down. They slow down your reflexes or increase your reaction time. Same thing. Your heart rate drops. Common depressants include alcohol. Depressants may work as follows. Depressants bind to the presynaptic membrane. Then, in contrast to stimulants, they just release less neurotransmitter substances. So you get less stimulation of the next neuron. So in other words, less impulses travel down this neuron, or impulses travel down this neuron less frequently. This will slow down your reaction time. Next up are the hallucinogens. This is the final group. Common hallucinogens include ecstasy and LSD. Hallucinogens work by changing or altering the perception of the world around you. Quite commonly, some hallucinogens affect your ability to perceive colour, so what would normally appear one colour looks different. 
Hallucinogens work by altering the pathway which electrical impulses travel down. So let's say, for example, this was the normal pathway from neuron 1 to 2 to 3, 1 to 2 to 3. Now a hallucinogen is involved, look what happens. It starts going down a different pathway. This leads to all the perceived changes from taking that drug. We can test the effect of stimulants and depressants by using a reaction timer test. In other words, testing how quickly one responds to a specific stimulus. So this experiment requires two people, both of them standing. The first person has their arms stretched and holds a meter ruler at the top. The second person has their forefinger and thumb open, not touching, but just underneath the ruler. Now, without any warning, person one will drop the ruler. Now, the job of person two is to catch the ruler as quickly as they can. So the further down the ruler falls, the slower the reaction time of that person, this person here. So if someone was to catch the ruler here, they'd have pretty good reflexes. If someone allowed it to fall this far down, you can assume their reaction time isn't quite as good or isn't quite as fast. So the further down the ruler is caught, the slower the reaction time. It's important to note here that if you took a depressant, you'd expect an increase in the reaction time and a stimulant would decrease the reaction time. Increasing the reaction time means that the reflex response is slower. Some students get very confused on that, but please understand it means the same thing. In other words, you're increasing the time it takes for someone to react to a stimulus, so you are reacting more slowly. Whereas a stimulant would decrease the reaction time, that means you'd respond much quicker, react quicker, because the reaction takes place in a shorter amount of time. And that is how you can describe the four general types of drugs and how they affect the body. So next up, let's look at the effects of smoking and drinking. Now I'm sure you've heard that smoking is bad for you, and these days in schools it's pretty hard not to know why. But as scientists, let's analyse this a little bit more closely. There are three chemicals produced in cigarette smoke which are harmful to you. The first is a colourless, odourless gas called carbon monoxide. The second is a thick, black, sludgy substance called tar. And the third is a chemical called nicotine. Now, carbon monoxide is a poison. It will kill you. Tar is a carcinogen. It's carcinogenic. That means it's cancer-causing. And as it builds up in your lungs, it particularly affects the chances of you developing lung cancer. And nicotine is addictive. So while nicotine isn't harmful like the other two, it does cause you to smoke more and therefore intake more tar and more carbon monoxide. Also, nicotine is a stimulant, and stimulants raise your heart rate and increase your blood pressure. So if you had a heart condition, you might want to watch your nicotine intake. Now, I said that carbon monoxide was a poison, but you need to know a little bit more about that. Basically, carbon monoxide is inhaled. It goes into your bloodstream, where it binds to hemoglobin. So you can see I've drawn the carbon monoxide demon here, binding or hugging onto hemoglobin and not letting it go. Now normally, we want oxygen to bind to hemoglobin, so hemoglobin transports it to the cells that need oxygen and then lets it go. But carbon monoxide irreversibly bonds to hemoglobin, so oxygen can't. In other words, you get less oxygen transported around the body, your rate of respiration falls, you get less energy, and eventually it will kill you. Admittedly, the amount of carbon monoxide emitted from a cigarette is pretty low, but it's still something to be aware of. Next up is alcohol, and alcohol can have short-term effects and long-term effects. Short-term effects include things like blurred vision, and it also lowers your inhibitions. I guess that could be interpreted in a way that makes you feel like you care less about how you're presenting yourself to the world. In other words, you might suddenly decide that you have mystical kung fu powers, but to everyone else watching you, you just look like an idiot waving your arms around in the air. Also, memory loss can occur as well. In the long run, the effects can be far more damaging. It can cause liver cirrhosis. Now look at that spelling. It's not particularly nice, but try and remember it. C -I -R 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 C-I-R-R-hosis, cirrhosis. Basically, your liver is a very important organ. It cleans your blood of harmful toxins, such as alcohol. So drinking small amounts of alcohol, your liver can deal with. But prolonged exposure to alcohol on a regular basis can start to create scars in the liver. Those scars indicate that parts of your liver are dying, cells are actually dying. And after a while, your liver no longer functions as a detoxifying organ. Long-term exposure to alcohol can also cause brain damage. 
So those are the health impacts of smoking tobacco and drinking alcohol. So finally, let's look at organ transplant ethics, and I'm sure you'll find this quite disturbing. I certainly do. So imagine there's a patient that needs an organ desperately or they will die. Now that patient might be unfortunate enough to contract a disease which has led to this condition or by misusing drugs and alcohol they may have self-inflicted this problem. No matter the reason, they will have to rely on a donor to supply a healthy organ. So once a donor is found with a matching blood type to avoid the organ being rejected by the patient's body, the doctor will cut out the organ, so a kidney for example is an organ someone can live without because you have two, and when you take one, and the other one actually gets larger to compensate for the one that's gone. The other kidney then gets transplanted into the patient's body. It doesn't have to be a kidney, it could be a bit of the liver, so a live patient, a live healthy patient can actually donate a bit of their liver, which can then develop inside the patient's body to do the job of a functioning liver. But it's also true many organs come from the recently deceased and they have to be recently deceased, recently died. Obviously you couldn't do a brain transplant if you're alive and hope that the uh, kind donor still survives. Now there's always a shortage of donors. I mean you may be a very moral and good person but maybe the idea of giving your organs away, your internal organs away, you find a little bit squeamish. So one of the biggest problems are there's always a shortage of organ donors, at least now anyway. So how do you go about donating anyway? Well, firstly, you can join the NHS Organ Donor Register. That lets the NHS know that you are willing to donate your organs upon death. However, it's not as simple as that. Your family still currently need to give consent even after filling out that form. So after you die, the family still needs to approve this donation of organs. Some people argue that an opt-out system would be much better this assumes that most people would probably be alright with giving away their organs, they just haven't got their act together to go down to the NHS or local hospital to sign the forms. So what it really says is, you're automatically put onto the organ donor register unless you call up and opt out. What do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? It would certainly save quite a few lives. Finally, let's look at the most controversial part of this video lesson, I'm sure it will be anyway, which is who gets my liver? So basically, doctors have a pretty tough time deciding on with a limited supply of organs and an endless seeming supply of people who need organs, who do you have to prioritise? How do you begin to prioritise which patient gets it? So hopefully this example will demonstrate the complexities of this issue. Okay, so we have three patients here, all in dire need of a liver. If they don't get a liver, they will die. However, there's only one liver to go around, so who's going to get it? Person A, B or C? Well, let's look at them first of all. Person A has a 40% chance of survival. They're also a heavy drinker and very unlikely to stop. Remember, drinking causes liver damage. Person B has a 40% chance of survival, but they are obese. People who are obese are less likely to survive the operation. Person C is a toddler with a 15% chance of survival. Being very young, they haven't acquired any drug habits, and they are not dangerously overweight. This is probably due to some sort of inherited condition. So, who do you think should get the organ? I'm sure most ethically minded people would say, well, the toddler should get it. They've got more life left in them. The other patients haven't really looked after themselves. This one's a very heavy drinker. They maybe deserve it. This person is very overweight. They should have looked after themselves better. But it doesn't work like that. Firstly, doctors will look at who has the highest chance of survival. You know, you've got to allocate your resources where they'll work. So the reality is that this toddler is probably the least likely person to get it. So now we have two candidates left. Well, they both have a similar chance of survival. However, this candidate is unlikely to give up drinking. So having once destroyed their liver, the chances are they'll also destroy the donor's liver. In other words, it could just be a waste of doctor's resources. So the most likely candidate in this situation is the obese person, as they have the highest rate of survival and are less likely to re-abuse their liver through alcohol consumption. Tough decision. Now I'm not saying that's exactly how it would go, but it certainly gives you food for thought. So remember, doctors take into account survival chance and also lifestyle choices.
So now you understand some of the ethical issues around organ donation.